This presentation will explain the concepts of pollutant load calculation and allocation within a watershed area. Understanding the concept of pollutant loads is critical to understanding how your watershed is functioning and how best to address any water quality problems. Loads help us understand the contributions to the problem and where and how to focus our efforts. This section will review what a pollutant load is and how to calculate it, and how to use the pollutant loading information to identify likely sources and develop appropriate best management practices that will help you address them. A pollutant load is the amount of a specific pollutant moving through a stream. It is based on both the concentration and the flow rate and is generally expressed as the weight of the pollutant over a period of time. For example, you might express nitrogen loading as pounds of nitrogen contributed by a watershed area over the course of a year. The diagram on the bottom of this slide illustrates the concentration of a pollutant in jars, transitioning from more dilute on the left to more concentrated on the right. Within the example watershed, the concentration becomes more diluted as it moves toward larger downstream reaches with higher flows or discharges. It's important to understand the relationship between concentration and flow. This means that the actual load of a pollutant may be greater from subwatersheds with lower concentrations if they have greater flows, as opposed to a subwatershed that may have a higher pollutant concentration but only a trickle of flow. Large pollutant loads from sub-watersheds can have significant impacts on the larger watershed as a whole. This slide further emphasizes the impact of including flow in your load calculation. The greater the volume over time, or flow, the greater the resulting mass over time, or load. The chart at the bottom of the slide shows conversion factors that can be used to translate from cubic feet per second to daily, monthly, and annual loading. To account for geographic size differences between watersheds or subwatersheds and enable the comparison and prioritization of subwatershed areas during the watershed planning process, a pollutant yield is calculated by dividing the total load by a unit of area, such as square miles. Yields are especially important to consider for non-point pollutant sources, since they account for land runoff. In this diagram of a watershed, the total load would account for all of the pollutant reaching the most downstream point, and the yield would be calculated by dividing this load by the entire area of the delineated watershed in black, plus the area flowing into the upstream station. So loads refer to pollutant measurements at a point and yields to pollutant amounts contributed by a land area. We can further define the load as either incremental or total. The total load is everything that's delivered to a given sampling point. For watershed planning, however, you need to know how specific areas contribute to that load. To figure out the loading from a localized area, you'll need to subtract out the upstream loading contributions. Incremental loads refer to the portion of the load from a sub-watershed area as opposed to the total load from the entire watershed. Just as you can determine total and incremental loads, you can also determine total and incremental yields. For the total yield, remember you divide the total load by the area of land draining to that point. For this watershed, shaded in red, this is everything in the black outlined area plus the upstream drainage area. For the incremental load of this area, shaded yellow, 
you divide the incremental yield by this localized drainage area, cutting out contributions from upstream. By doing this, you're better able to understand smaller areas and address localized sources. Once you've determined a pollutant load, you'll want to compare it to a water quality standard or benchmark. If it's greater than this standard, you'll see how much the level needs to be reduced to achieve the criteria of a healthy stream. The process may seem very straightforward at this point. However, we need to talk about the second part of the equation, flow. Determining the concentration to use in a load calculation will be based on some summary calculation, such as an average or geometric mean from your sampling results. However, determining which flow rate to use can be more challenging since flow rates can vary greatly and you don't want to bias your loading rate based on a single flow observation. This graph from the Wolf Run Watershed shows how much load calculations could vary depending on which flow rate is chosen over a four hour time period. All of the sampling events captured rising water at the site, with the exception of the light blue star. Using an average of the flow measured in the field would only provide a representation of the time in which the sampler happened to arrive at the site. It's therefore important that the flow conditions in the watershed are normalized in some way. One way that you can calculate estimates of pollutant loads over varying flow conditions is to use a watershed model. There are lots of different types of models, ranging from simple spreadsheets to complex computer programs. They use cause and effect relationships to estimate loads under varying conditions. And they're based on a set of equations that can be used to help describe natural or man-made processes in the system, such as runoff or stream transport. In order to select your model, you need to think about and consider what types of data you have. Did your sampling include both wet and dry events? During watershed planning, the division of water requires sampling to occur and encompass two wet and two dry events. What sorts of flows are represented during your monitoring? Did you capture everything from low to high flows? Did, were any sites dry on a regular basis and have you accounted for those dry sites? If not, perhaps you can only make some general statements or conclusions. Do you have a way to generate representative flows for subwatershed sites? possibly by using a relationship with a nearby water flow gauge based on field measurements. Some pre-screening of the data by weather and flow will be helpful in deciding whether you can group your data by flow and weather conditions. And if the data can be grouped in this way, then the load may be represented by the portion of the year in which those conditions occur. All of these questions will factor into selecting your watershed monitoring, modeling approach. The EPA's Handbook for Developing Watershed Plans provides a helpful overview of many different types of models that might be used. These can depend on the type of data you have, your sampling frequency, the water quality parameters you assessed, and the types of BMPs you expect to implement. The point is you should be thinking about and making decisions on what type of modeling you plan to use so that you can tailor your data collection to meet the needs of that model. Once you've settled on a model to use, you'll use the same method that you use to calculate existing loads with your measured concentrations to generate a target load using benchmark concentrations. 
In addition to the waste load allocation from point sources and the load allocation from runoff and background sources, TMDLs also factor in a margin of safety as a buffer for any error, as well as future growth capacity to allow for added loading from future development. It's important to note that illegal pollutant sources, such as combined sewer overflows or sewage straight pipes, are not factored into the TMDL calculation. This is because TMDLs are regulatory. They address capacity for permitted or unpermitted loads, while watershed plans can add calculations for non-regulatory contributions. For example, although much of the pollutant load for bacteria in an urban area may be due to aged sanitary sewer infrastructure, this source is considered illegal, so no allocation would be made in a TMDL. Also, TMDLs are developed for a day as opposed to loading and watershed plans, which typically consider a year. While the process of development is somewhat similar, TMDLs are typically developed for a critical flow period, usually the period in which the load greatly, most greatly exceeds the criteria. However, because that flow does not occur, occur every day, it can be hard to track success using a TMDL. For this reason, a TMDL may not always be helpful in achieving successful watershed improvement. More typically, a TMDL calculation is used to help regulators determine whether or not there is sufficient capacity in a water body for added inputs from permitted point source dischargers. As with the process used in existing load comparison to benchmark loads in watershed planning, a TMDL is also compared to related water quality criteria. For example, if a stream is already exceeding its water quality criteria for nitrogen, a discharge permit application that would result in added nitrogen inputs from a proposed sewage treatment plant upgrade would not be acceptable. One interesting note is that permitted dischargers must be allocated all of the capacity in the permit, even if they are discharging significantly less. This means that the in-stream concentrations achieved by implementation of the TMDL may actually be well below the water quality standard. In contrast, a watershed plan is not concerned with how much a discharger is allowed to pollute, but how much they actually are. The goal is to come up with the most cost-effective plan to reduce pollutant loading from existing levels to target levels. In this example of an annual load reduction goal for achieving acceptable phosphorus loading, you can see how the phosphorus sources may need to be reallocated to achieve the goal. Sources of phosphorus from developed, forested, and agricultural lands, as well as the stream bank itself, will need to be reduced. And in the next step of planning, we can begin to suggest ways to achieve these goals by recommending corresponding BMPs. Stream bank stabilization can reduce phosphorus loading from phosphorus attached to eroded soils. Using literature values, you can make some approximations of how many eroding feet of stream bank will need to be addressed. Stormwater BMPs, such as rain gardens or pervious pavement or streetscaping on developed land, can enhance stormwater absorption before the runoff reaches the stream. In this case, the number of acres that would need to be captured can be calculated. Logging BMPs can also reduce soil-related phosphorus loading by minimizing the erosion potential from these operations. And agricultural nutrient management can help keep needed phosphorus on cropland and reduce the application of unneeded phosphorus fertilizers. For all these practices, literature references can be consulted to estimate the type of reductions for a given BMP. Second priority, is the western subwatershed that has the greatest total nitrogen loads. And finally, the lowest priority, or priority three, is the subwatershed that has the lowest loads of both total nitrogen and E. coli. And by comparing the actual loads to the target loads, we can see how much pollutant reduction is needed to meet water quality standards. 
In our example watershed, the first priority subwatershed needs 65% reduction of total nitrogen and 75% of E. coli to meet the standards, whereas the second priority only needs to reduce total nitrogen by 45% and E. coli by 50%. Final prioritization should also consider other contributing factors in each subwatershed. These include land use and land cover characterization. This will help you decide what types of BMPs will be needed to address the prevailing land uses and if they're likely to be affected. Also, you might want to know if much of the watershed area is already protected as public or forested lands. Geological characteristics can make a difference, such as if the geology is favorable for karst formations that could allow for underground pollutant flows into or out of the watershed area, making it more difficult to track. Soil characteristics are affecting your decisions by letting you know if the soil type is more easily erodible and likely to contribute to loading, they can determine how fast or slow infiltration of stormwater occurs and if the soils are already high in certain nutrients, such as bluegrass soils that are, tend to be higher in phosphorus. Available stakeholder support is critical. If there's local interest in protecting or restoring water quality, that can really boost your efforts. And you might want to align your watershed planning goals with those that are already there with the local community. Um, local concerns such as pending development permit or a threatened water supply may also help you with your watershed management initiatives. And finally, available funding can make some subwatershed efforts easier. If there are available funding sources that could help pay for your proposed BMPs, such as farm bill cost share programs that help pay for agricultural projects, um, that could be helpful. Or a proposed development project that could incorporate stormwater BMPs, such as retention basins or um, artificial wetlands areas. All of these factors should be considered when you're deciding where to target your efforts first. To summarize, once you've evaluated the monitoring data and the relevant watershed characteristics, you're then going to prioritize your sub-watershed focus areas and identify likely pollutant sources. Then you can devel begin developing the appropriate best management practice recommendations for that area. This is the stage at which we will approach the next Watershed Academy module, which will discuss land use impacts to water quality and related best management practices. Before moving into this module's final section, which will delve into some spreadsheet tools for managing and manipulating water quality data, we'll go through a few exercises in interpreting flow and loading graphs. This overview will hopefully help you better understand some of the technical subtleties of these graphs, which can help further fine tune your management recommendations. First, let's familiarize ourselves with a flow duration curve. This type of graph plots flows on the vertical y-axis versus the percentage of time that a specific flow rate is equaled or exceeded on the horizontal x-axis. A flow duration curve is useful because it characterizes the ability of the watershed area to provide flows of various magnitudes. The highest flows are plotted on the left-hand side of the graph and the lowest flows, possibly all the way down to zero, are on the right side of the graph. Mid-range flows are plotted in the middle of the curve, and a logarithmic scale is typically used for the flow values on the y-axis. The shape of the flow duration curve in its upper and lower regions is particularly significant in evaluating the stream and its watershed characteristics. The shape of the curve in the high flow region indicates the type of flood regime the basin is likely to have, whereas the shape of the low flow region characterizes the ability of the watershed to sustain low flows during the dry seasons. A very steep curve in the high flow region 
would be expected for rain caused flooding on small watersheds, whereas a much flatter curve in the high flow region could be expected where reservoir storage is regulated for flood control or snowmelt flooding occurs. In the low flow region, an intermittent stream would exhibit periods of no flow, whereas a very flat curve indicates that moderate flows can be sustained throughout the year due to natural or artificial stream flow regulation or a large groundwater capacity which can sustain the base flow to the stream. Now let's look at a load duration curve. This type of curve plots a pollutant's benchmark value multiplied by flow and then uses a conversion factor for the time frame being considered. In this example, we're looking at fecal coliform loading per day with the benchmark value indicated by the blue graphed line. Specific monitoring results are plotted with their respective fecal coliform concentrations and flow rates. Sampling results characterized as occurring during wet events are plotted as green triangles and dry event results are plotted as red squares. You can see that there are many more detections of fecal coliform above the blue benchmark line for the wet events than for the dry events. This is likely indicative of a runoff source or could be from sewer system overflows. There are several benefits of considering load duration curves before drawing your conclusions about pollutant sources and causes. First, when you compare the loading to flow rates, you can better identify of when the load contributions are occurring. You can also better predict point versus non-point sources, and the graphs consider lots of data and condense them into an easy format. They can also help you identify sampling gaps, such as possibly not capturing enough wet data events that may prompt you to conduct further sampling. So with some technical assistance to develop these graphs, you can better refine your watershed assessment. Here are some of the main takeaways from this section on pollutant loads. Pollutant loads are integral to deciding what where and how many BMPs should be recommended. They enable comparison with a similarly calculated target load, which drives goal setting. And the related flow duration and load duration curves can effectively demonstrate when problems are occurring and how to address those water quality problems.